I'm Adam Catterall, Nick Pete alongside me, and the main man, Dan Hardy, with us as well. One question, have we just seen the greatest mixed martial arts grappler of all oh, time? He's phenomenal, isn't he? He's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, his, his ability just to, just to take someone down, lock them up and grind them out, and you can just see the fight just draining out of Poirier. And every time, and the thing, the, 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 the the result that it has when you start to drain someone like that is when there is a, a moment to get into the fight, they give it everything, which actually backfires on him. Yeah. You know, he thought he had him hurt in the second, he comes crashing forward with wild punches, gets overzealous. He thought he had that guillotine in the third, he's squeezing like hell on that. I mean, it just, it worked against him because there's so few opportunities to get into a fight with Khabib, you know? I had, I had a conversation with Dustin post-fight, obviously very upset. Yeah. And he talks about living with regrets now for the rest of his life. When you were there, Octagon side, and you're watching him, and he has that guillotine choke in there, are you just screaming, why, why are you not going, get him in full guard, or whatever it may be? Did, did, did the occasion maybe get to him a touch? No, I don't think it did. I just think that Khabib is that good. I think Dustin will watch it back and go, you know what? I did give it everything. In the second round, I did start unloading wild furries to try and land something to turn the fight around. In the third round, when I was absolutely exhausted, I had nothing left in the tank, I threw everything I had at that guillotine. He probably should have let that go a lot sooner. He was burning his arms out terribly, but he wouldn't give it up, he wouldn't give it up. And that for me means that he'd give it everything. He can look at himself in the mirror tonight. I know he was you know, upset immediately afterwards, but I think he'll get back to the hotel, he'll look himself in the mirror and go, you know what? I give that my best shot tonight. My best shot just wasn't good enough tonight. And you know, I, there's not a, a lightweight on the planet, potentially ever that would have been Khabib in here tonight in front of that crowd. He was a man possessed, and I described him as a locomotive. There was just no stopping him. From start to finish, he was sensational. He's even better in the flesh, isn't he? I mean, a lot of fans obviously watching this will have watched him on TV, and he's very impressive. But when you actually see what he does, yeah. up close and personal in the octagon, it's, it's actually quite frightening. It's so much more impactful when you're there live as well. You know, when you can actually see when you, when you can actually see the strength and the physicality of his ability to control people, to bind their legs up and keep stripping their grip away. And no, I mean, there were a few things that stood out to me tonight, that, things that I'd never seen before. Like one obvious thing to do, you know, when somebody's trying to take you down, you hit a switch, you go on the inside leg and you try and reverse the position. And Poirier did it twice in the fight from what I remember. And both times, Khabib took Mount from that position. Yeah. I'm still not exactly sure how he did that. I mean, I'm learning as I'm watching him as well, which is, I mean, it's a blessing for me as an analyst. But at the same time, I kind of feel like I want to know exactly what he's doing, and I still don't. There was a shot from Khabib in the second round, and he hit Dustin so hard and so heavy and so quick. I thought they were going to fall through the fence. That's how bad it was. It was so deep on him. And at that point, you're just thinking, wow, man, this guy's just on a completely different level. The conversations, obviously, after that are what is next. Khabib says that he wants a burger. That's the only thing that's yeah. on his mind at the moment in time, and you'll probably hear that conversation in a moment or two. We spoke to Dana. He said the only fight in the 155 division right now is Tony Ferguson. Agree? Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be. I mean, we've seen it, what, made three, four times now. They've tried to make that fight, and it's just not happened. If Khabib needs some time off, if Tony Ferguson needs some time off, whatever we need to do to enable these two fighters to step in and face each other, that's got to be the priority of the sport right now. It's got to be the priority of the UFC. But at the same time, I'm excited for other, other guys in this division that could potentially you know, be a contender for Khabib. The name that keeps coming up is fighting next weekend, Justin Gaethje. Yeah. You know, if he has a good performance next next week against Cowboy, I want to see Justin Gaethje get moved up there because stylistically, I think he's an interesting matchup for Khabib. Tony Ferguson is the antithesis of Khabib. Yes. You know, wild striking, spinning elbows, and then he hits the ground and he's got a whole array of, of submissions that he can use. And after the the the, um, the near arming guillotine tonight you start thinking Tony Ferguson might be able to capitalize on that with them long bony arms that he's got. He might be able to wrap that up tighter. But then I look at someone like Justin Gaethje and I think that scrappy front headlock style with the heavy hands that he's got, that might actually fit Khabib's style better. It's exciting at the moment, Khabib himself said, you know, next week maybe I'm the pound for pound guy, maybe I'm the guy you put up there. But the great thing about Khabib is there's no, there's no real push to see him move up a weight division or even move down. I think people are quite happy to see him at 155. He needs to wipe this division out. And as Dan said, there's two or three guys that he's still got to put onto his ledger before we talk about any potential super fights. And those two guys, for me, Tony Ferguson, even prior to tonight, with all due respect to Dust Dustin Poirier, Tony Ferguson's the toughest fight out there for Khabib because he's absolutely dynamic in every area. He's 
matters a box of frogs so we will approach the fight completely differently you know Dustin all week here has been so respectful as Habib and I think he went in there with a lot of respect for Habib as well and what Habib can do and sometimes that just makes you hesitate for a split second because you know what the guy's capable of Tony Ferguson's brain doesn't work like that he goes in there believing that he's got the cardio and the technical ability to destroy any man and, he, and, and he'll go at Khabib and he'll take the chances maybe that Dustin slightly held back on you just mentioned superstardom there all week I've been amazed at how well Habib has been received here. I mean, I knew it was going to be good, but it was crazy. Obviously, in the octagon tonight when he's making the walk, it was absolutely ludicrous. We've kind of all danced to his tune this week, and we've only seen that previously with the likes of Ronda Rousey and Conor. Is he the biggest star that the UFC have got right now? I, I certainly think he's up there. He's the most effective star that the UFC have got right now. I think that's fair, fairer to say. I think, you know, with... With Nate Diaz and with Masvidal, you've got real characters there, and I think that they're very easy to gravitate towards. I think they give us good sound bites. They're fascinating to watch. There's something scary about watching Khabib fight, and there's yeah. something scary about about the, the the aura that he has. I mean, he's he's very stoic. He's he's very much a closed book. He has been all week. Didn't really want to do anything outside of what he absolutely had to do, um, and I find that fascinating. But at, uh, at the same time, his stardom is based on his ability to perform in the octagon, and and the, the rest of it is just bonus material for me when it comes to Khabib. Seeing, seeing him trade shirts and wear Poirier's shirt at the end and then publicly say, I'm going to you know, raffle this shirt off or sorry, sell it on social media, make a lot of money, and then I'm going to give the money to Dustin for his charity work and all that kind of stuff. That's the kind of superstardom. That's the kind of superstar move that, for me now, that almost wipes away what went on with Conor McGregor. It almost oh, yeah. pushes everything onto Conor McGregor and you go, actually, Khabib's not that guy. Khabib is this guy. A guy that wants to give back and is a role model for the sport and that this week for me has absolutely proved that he's clearly a superstar out here in the Middle East he's clearly a superstar in Russia and I think it's about time the rest of the world bought onto it as well when he uh, jumped the octagon at the end of the fight everyone panicked, <laughs> <Didn't they? laughs> yeah, everyone panicked. Did. especially Dana because yeah. he was running at then I thought oh, hey, what's going on here <laughs> well with that in mind we spoke to both fighters conflicting emotions post fight here's what they had to say were you in trouble in second round I see everything. Only one thing it was very close is guillotine. But when he punched me, I see everything. Habib, we normally see in football people swapping shirts at the end of matches. You must have an awful amount of respect for Dustin Poirier because you swap shirts with him at the end of the fight. Sorry, brother, what do you say? You must have an awful amount of respect for Dustin Poirier swapping shirts in the manner that you did at the end of the fight. Yeah. Because this is this sport about respect. Number one thing in this sport, mixed martial arts, this is respect. When you come to the gym, like we teach, I, 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 I teach kids four years. Since 2008 to 2012, I, te I, I teach kids for combat sambo, you know. And first things what I teach for kids, hey, you have to respect gym, you have to respect your, like, uh, your sparring partners teammates you have to respect coaches you have to respect everybody this sport about respect you can't use this in, in outside you know in street or somewhere you have to be respect you have to take care of everybody you know this sport about respect this sport not about trash talking and that's why I like beginning of this uh, like when they um, when officially they uh, have, uh, say these fights like uh, we show respect each other you know and only my last fight when I fight with this guy, it was crazy because of him, but MMA is about respect. Dana has said that Tony Ferguson is next. When do you want to do it? Next burger. I want to eat some burger and steak. Please give me a couple days rest. You guys want to put me tomorrow on cage, you know. Please give me a little bit rest, you know. Last two years it was very busy for me, you know. It's uh, like 18, 19, you know, 2018, 2019. Please give me a little bit rest, you know, it's like maybe a couple of days. I knew it was going to be on me. I knew it was going to be tough. Uh, you know, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. I just wonder if I could have maybe did more. You know, I had underhooks. Maybe I didn't try to get off the fence. I'm going to beat myself up about this for the rest of my life, you know. Uh, I don't know. Talk to me about the week in general, because building up to it, we spoke to you on a couple of times. Mentally, you were in great shape. Physically, you were in great shape. Tonight, the crowd gave you a wonderful, wonderful reception too. Yeah, and no, it was a great week. One of the, probably the best weight cut I've had to 155 pounds. I have no excuses, man. Khabib's a world champ. Uh, I prepared very well for 10 weeks. 
I, I, that's it. I, uh, I lost. As you say, you're going to beat yourself up about this for a period of time, but you are a champ, and I've no doubt at some point, once the dust settles and you've, you're able to process this, you will want to come back and compete once again at 155. You said some wonderful words at the back end of that uh, fight there where you were talking about there's a little bit more tread left on the tyres. You know, I do. I feel like I have a, a lot of fights left in me if I want. It's just this was my 41st mixed martial arts fight. These kind of pinnacle moments don't happen a lot in, in your career, and, you know, I feel like I... I'm gonna have to live with tonight for the rest of my life. I worked, you know, 14 years. I've mixed martial arts to get here, 41 fights. And, uh, you know, I just gotta get home and see what's next. I'm not fighting just to fight. I'm fighting to be the world champ. And uh, uh, we just gotta see, you know. So Dustin, as I mentioned earlier on, very emotional post fight, very hard on himself, actually. There's a couple of guys I spoke to tonight that were very hard on themselves, and we'll get to that later on. But Dustin in particular, and you were alluding to a moment or two ago, when the dust settles on that and he looks at that performance, I think he'll conclude that there's still a lot left in the tank. And as he said, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of uh, tread left on the tyres. There's a few more fights left for him in this division. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it does soften the blow when you, when you kind of realise how good Habib is. You yeah. know, as frustrating as it was to lose against GSP, it's like, it's GSP, you know, it was an honour to fight him, it was an honour to share the octagon with him. And I think, you know, like you said, after a couple of days when he when he's watched the fight, when he's realised that he did give a good account of himself, you know, there were a couple of moments there where th there was a buzz in the arena, there was an excitement yeah. that something might happen that we didn't expect. Poirier's a veteran, you know, he'll look at what Michael Bisping did with his career, he'll get back on track, he'll think two or three fights. and. He's also getting to that stage in his career as well where because he's so familiar to the fans and because he's got such a fan favorite style, there are going to be interesting fights out there for him regardless of, 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 of where he is in the rankings. Yeah. You know, I, I, think he'll, I think he'll find his feet and I think there are really interesting fights in the future for him. Well, on that, and speaking of fan favorite fights, uh, the co -main event between Barbosa and Felder, maybe there's an opportunity there for uh, Poirier in his next step. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, talk about fights living up to expectation or performances living up to expectation. That was an absolute humdinger of a fight, wasn't it? Brilliant. You know, ju just as good as the first one, maybe even better. I've concluded something, by the way. You asked a question this week on uh, the BT Sports social media feeds. What would you rather take? Yeah. A spinning elbow <laughs> of Paul Felder or a, a leg kick from Barboza? At one point, they both, did, they both, did, they the both did them at the same time. Yeah, Having yeah, said yeah. that, though, once you're octagon side and you hear the thud of a Barbosa leg kick, thank you. I don't want none of that smoke. You're changing your mind <laughs> I'm totally you're changing, changing my mind. mind. I don't want none of that smoke. <laughs> They're unbelievable when he sinks them in, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, and they're so days. quick as well. Even the body kick, that switch lead body kick that he kept landing on Felder. I, you know, I still felt that Felder was making some of the mistakes that he made in the first fight. I think sometimes he gets, he gets too excited to trade shots. He gets too excited to just stand at that striking range and just go blow for blow. And the speed at which Barbosa moves at, oh, yeah. you're always going to come out of that. I mean, he came out of the first round looking like he'd been hit by a truck. You know, he had a couple of cuts on his face, he was redness on his body. Barbosa's the kind of fighter that you 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 can't give any 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 space to. Otherwise, they're just going to be lethal the whole time, no matter what they're throwing at you. Like, we watched Khabib against Barbosa, and he just bulldozed him forward. It's the locomotive style. He, he just ran into his range, right into his comfort zone. And then he, then you could see that crowd in, was starting to affect Barbosa negatively. And I think I think Felder did that at moments, but he didn't do it enough. No, he didn't. He didn't. He wasn't able to build his momentum up strong enough. It was a really close fight. Could have gone either way for me. I thought, I thought Edson Barbosa probably just nicked it, if I'm totally honest. Quite disappointed. Two of the judges scored it 30-27 either way. Yeah. Um, it's never a 30-27 fight. It was definitely not a 30-27 fight. No, I think, as I say, I think Edson Barbosa is going to go away and be really disappointed he didn't get the decision. But you know what? I think Paul Felder, the journey that he's been on, you know, he works so hard. He's been so good all this week. Uh, he gave that fight everything he had. Technically, it probably wasn't the step up which he imagined it was going to be. Edson's just so strong. But I'd like to see both move on now, and, and potentially that's a fight for Dustin, isn't it? You know, Paul Felder versus Dustin would be a, would be a brilliant fight. All week you've been uh, talking about Laurent Murphy. You picked him out early doors, the guy that spits out bullets. I think you were referring to him as. Yeah. How impressed were you that that kid took that on four weeks' notice? Four weeks ago, mate. He's in Jamaica on an all-inclusive. We's we misses having a right old time of it, isn't he? And now he's making his UFC debut in that heat in a fight where a lot of people were saying he's been brought in, he's been he's been fed to a lion. Yeah, well, that was that was the game plan. Obviously, that was what you, we seen, felt like was being set up here. 
uh, you know, a guy that, to be honest, most UK fans had never even heard of before. Comes in with an you know, 8 0 record, but really right under the radar, nowhere near fought at this level before. He comes in against one of Habib's stable mates, who's an absolute monster. And first round, you're thinking, oh, this, this could be tough for Lerone. You know, he, he, he was struggling to re- look like a little bit like a cat caught in the headlights. And you were thinking, okay, he's still in the fight. He's, you know, he, he's, he was getting back to his feet well. He was working himself up against the fence. He was avoiding, you know, he was, he was getting back up off the takedowns. You thought, okay, let's restart again, second round. And then for me, second and third round, he's sensational. Okay, he got taken down a couple of times again, but every time he got taken down, he, he, wasn't, he didn't take any punishment on the ground whatsoever. When the fight was standing up, he was lighting the place up. So, I, and, and immediately afterwards, he was standing in the center of the octagon, his head was down, he was, you could see he was disappointed. When what he should have been, his, his head should have been up. He won that fight, in my opinion. He won rounds two and three. He can be really, now he's back at the hotel, and be really disappointed when he sees the fight afterwards because I kind of think that that moment was stolen from him a little bit. Mm. I, uh, again, put that question to Dana. When you put a performance like that in on four weeks' notice, imagine what the kid can do on a full camp. I think we're going to see him back in the UFC sometime soon, aren't we? No doubt, no doubt. There were, there were a lot of things that stood out about his game that I was very impressed with. His footwork for, for a start, you know, I'm a big fan of footwork. I, th- I thought he moved so well in and out of range. He used feints very well. Fluid between switching stances as well. Absolutely, that, which is a benefit. That's the future of the sport. Absolutely, yep. there, there won't be stances in the future of MMA. I think everybody will switch stances, and I think it will be a it will be a detriment if you do limit yourself to one side. So we've already seen him, you know, moving in ways that we want to we want to see a contender move. I think with a full training camp, I think with preparation focused on a particular fighter, I think he's going to do wonderful things. Mm. Would you run that fight back? Because as the fight finished, yeah. his opponent's out. Absolutely carried, exhausted. Literally carried from the octagon he was. Um, no, it, it probably won't get run back, let's be totally honest. But you know, I, I just think as soon as Lerone can get back in again, because he was fresh as a daisy. He needs to be on the UFC now because he, you know, he's he stepped in a late notice. He's done the UFC a bit of a favour. Now you want to push back a little bit and say, listen, get me out again before the end of the year. Let me show you what I can do after the 10-week fight camp. And if he's putting in performances like that, under those conditions as well, mm. against the guy that's a heavy, heavy grappler, and yet he's clearly a striker, you know, he's got that incredible footwork, as you say. Um, Oliver Harrison, red footwork, his uncle, Oliver Harrison, the boxing coach. It, this guy could go, I think, a mayor, to be honest, I was saying this to some of the UFC a mayor team, you've got a new superstar on your hands here. This guy, needs, his story needs to be told. We, we probably told it first on BT Sports. His story needs to be told big star because where he's come from is unbelievable to where he is now. Mm. He's changed his life. He's a role model. and He's got the potential to go a long way. Well, his fighting style most certainly impressed the audience. And I've no doubt people watching this uh, will be impressed even more with the way that he personally reacted to the fight. Take a listen to this. Laurent, you've walked into the backstage. You're, you're down. You're disappointed. Talk me through your initial reactions to the result. Feels like a loss. I know for a fact I should have won that fight. Um, I got lots of days in the first round, give that round away. I was just forcing things. I, d- I didn't feel like myself in there. Um, got taken down too easily, man. I should have won that fight. Should have won that fight. From an observer, yes, you were taken down, but it didn't look like he was doing too much work whilst he was taking you down. You looked comfortable. Yeah, he wasn't doing anything. He was holding on for dear life, trying to get that win. He wasn't doing a thing. I didn't, apart from the time when he caught me in the first round, he didn't do a thing for me. I think uh, I should have finished that guillotine. You can't, you can't let opportunities uh, go like like that at this level. You have to, you have to finish them opportunities. You've done that on four weeks notice I think you're beating yourself up a little bit mate four weeks notice and for you to be able to perform like that I've no doubt we'll be seeing you back in the UFC sometime soon yeah but I know how good I am and I'm 10 times better than that I promise you so next time you see me out you'll see the real me regarding the actual decision uh, a split draw is how it all finished yeah. do you feel that maybe home advantage the crowd reacting to every single takedown maybe played it played a played part yeah of course of course he wasn't trying to win that fight he wasn't trying to win that fight he was he was waiting for me to throw when he got older me he was just holding on he wasn't trying to win that fight at all times i was trying to win that fight i was attacking from the bottom i was going forward trying to finish the fight talk to me about the experience because it's oh. noisy in there oh it was amazing i loved being the away fighter it gave me energy it gave me energy i loved it man. i loved it listen try not beat up on yourself too much mate four weeks yep. and that type of performance just imagine what we can do on a full camp yeah trust me look out for me next year i'm going to go out to the states next month train get a million times better and the next time you see a better me uh, there was one other brit on the card Giorgio. and i'll tell you something we've been saying all week please pull the trigger please pull the trigger 
And I actually thought it was a competitive fight, don't get me wrong, there's a few takedowns in there and there's a little bit of needle in that first round, but I thought once she got into the rhythm of the fight, she then started to control the fight and obviously she ended up getting a hand raise, which obviously delighted her. Yep. Yeah, she, I mean, she needed it. She needed a, a win and she needed a standout performance, which I think we got from her. You know, that, w like, like always, we know that Joanne Calderwood's a great tie boxer. We know that if she's in a fight where someone's going to engage her on the feet, she looks excellent. But as soon as there's a possibility of someone shooting and taking her down, she gets very tentative. And we not only saw her defend takedowns today, but use excellent work in the clinch and get takedown of her own. I, I mean, say she, she yeah. got her own takedown in there. I mean, that's a big turning point for her, yeah. I think, because that's going to not only bolster her confidence, but it's also going to add a new level to her game, which is going to make people respect her tie boxing even more. And Andrea Lee is a good fighter. Yes. You know, It would have been weird if we'd have seen Joanne Calder would completely blow her out of the water because I know how good uh, Andrea Lee is. So to see her in a competitive fight where she showed several different levels of a game that we'd not seen before, and her tie boxing is still outstanding. You know, Great elbows on the inside. Uh, she backed up Andrea Lee several times. She put her against the fence. I mean, I, I just think she's found her place. She's found her spot at Syndicate in Las Vegas. She's got a good team of people around her. And I think we'll, now we'll start to see her really build on that program. Up to number five in the rankings as well now. Mm. So, um, Do you want to see her be less polite when she's calling people out? Listen, <laughs> well, well, the problem was, inside the octagon, she never called anybody out. She yeah. said, I, I, I'll take whatever the US you want to give me. If they want to give me a title shot, that's fine. That's lovely. And you're, you're sitting there thinking, come on, just call the champion out. Call someone out. Get that fight made. But... Mm. She's too sweet, isn't she? Well, I did um, obviously stick my microphone in her face okay. and I tried, I tried to get that out of her. This is what she had to say. In, in the build up to this, we were talking about last time out where you didn't necessarily pull the trigger and maybe came away from that fight with a little bit of disappointment. How happy are you with the performance that you've just put in in front of this crowd in Abu Dhabi? I can never, I always have to ask my team like as soon as I come out because you never, you know the fight is a blur so I, I can't really criticise or say how good it was. I, I felt good in there, I felt like I put it on her and uh, yeah I'll just have to see the tape and take it from there. Take it from me, third round, you were landing quite significantly um, and as that fight seemed to progress, I was just talking about conditions, you seemed to be getting stronger, did you feel that? I just know for a fact that I just said it to myself when this whole camp and as I get closer to the fight, I'm not I'm not giving up and I'm doing what I can to get the win. So I feel like that pushed me even uh, harder. So up here, and obviously I've got the conditioning behind me. Uh, I train very hard and all that confidence comes along. And so when you feel like you start fading, you've got your mind and you can tell yourself like, no, you, you're going to get this and that's what I feel like pushed me forward. That's three wins in four in this weight category now. Can't be too far away from a title shot, can we? No. And I'm really grateful to be in the top, t uh, top five and just fighting the best out of there and putting... I'm, gl I'm glad this one was an exciting fight and yeah, I'm just ready for the next one. Stay active and keep putting on perf uh, really good, uh, exciting fights for the fans. There you go. She mentioned someone's name. She mentioned Shevchenko's name. What do you reckon? Shevchenko was in the building as well. It was the perfect opportunity to do it out there. Exactly. Not on here. I'm glad that you did it for BT Sport, but you should have done it out there. Exactly. Come on. Shows where her confidence is, though. You know, in a new in a new game, in her new abilities. I, I, I think that shows a strength of character and a strength of her, of her confidence, which. I mean, if she gets that fight, it's going to be a hell of a test for her. But she's, you know, she's got to, she's got to think to the top if she's going to ever be a champion. She for the moon. Listen, if you're uh, watching this show and you're thinking it actually sounded like a good card and I didn't buy it, listen, it's still available on BT Sport box office highlights. I'm going to go Ferreira. What oh, a performance! Yes. Absolutely, it's kicked off the main card on BT Sport box office. Turned the fight around because I thought in the first round he looked in a little bit of trouble. Last minute of the first round, up the pace and then for 10 minutes, yeah. absolutely leathered him. Silenced it? an entire arena, absolutely silenced the place. And Tysimov's a monster as well, to be yeah. able to push him back and outbox him like that. And he just looked so comfortable, so slick. Kept coming over the top with that right hand and cracking him clean. Kept putting a kick on the end, I like it. You know, Tysimov's a rising superstar yeah, he and he looked awful tonight, but it was he made him, he made him look awful. Your highlight, I know where you're going. You've been hanging around him all week. Islam Makachev. That's the man. I just thought he was absolutely sensational. You know, his boxing was 
so on point it was crazy slipping everything landing combinations the guy has got such fast hands future champion for me absolutely and then when he eventually gets dragged down to the floor against the guy who's won the adc title like right, twice a jiu-jitsu is he dominates on the floor as well for me the star performer of the night absolutely now He's, he's going to pick a knockout, isn't he? Plus, uh, which one's he going for? <laughs> Let's have a pick which a one's he going for? Go on. <laughs> Otman Azaitar. Oh, yes. Right? F the, the power that he's got for the, for the weight class that he's in. And, and uh, I mean, Timu Pakalen, again, we saw him stiff, fell to the canvas. It was a clean iconic, knockout. It's one an punch. iconic knockout, it is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. And, you know, he's really launched himself into the UFC now. A lot of people are going to be interested in him. Obviously, his brother's in the UFC as well, so we've got that, you know, another sibling story in the UFC and his, his brother's a devastating striker as well so I, I, I'm going to keep an eye on that kid now that's the fighting done the big what do they call them a gigatron the big screens at the top the gigatron I think they call them the gigatron the jumbotron, the jumbotron. Is that jumbotron. What it is? I think it's a jumbotron buddy yeah. well whatever it is the big screen basically <laughs> showed a promo for UFC 244 the big old telly get excited <laughs> we already know that Till and Gastelum are on the card and now they've just given us the main event Masvidal Diaz. This was what, what look at you two getting a shake. <laughs> oh, hey, right, I want to book my tickets for, now, for oh, New York no. now. New York, Madison Square Garden uh -huh. is the destination. You couldn't ask, I mean, they're making a belt for this. Yeah. You know, I, I can't give you the, the full title of the actual belt. The but DMF, are, the yes, DMF belt. You know, you know what I mean, we'll leave it at that. But they're making their own unique belt for this fight. Belt's irrelevant. It's an unbelievable fight, isn't it? No, it's not. The belt's not irrelevant. That <laughs> now becomes the most important belt in the UFC right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Because we've got the two biggest stars in the UFC, two of the biggest trash talkers, the biggest personalities. They both want to fight each other. And what is even more interesting about it is that you've got Colby Covington and Kamaru Usman that are actually talking about that fight. You know, like Colby Covington and um, Masvidal used to be trend, friends and training partners. Yeah, yeah. Now they're going back and forth on Twitter. Mm. But the fans are so interested in the Masvidal Diaz fight that the welterweight title doesn't really even seem to matter. Nobody cares. It's the, it's the King of the Streets belt. That's the uh, that's the one King that everybody of the wants. To. <laughs> is that is that the hottest card of the year as of, as of now? We don't know what's coming later on in the year. It's been in warm here time. today. I tell you what. Yeah, it's been no, warm exactly. Here. <laughs> we'll have to do well to beat this. I don't know. New York in November. I don't know. I'm thinking it's going to do 50 degrees. But for, for me, it's just the biggest fight in the UFC. Period. And I can't remember any time in the last two, three years when the biggest fight in the UFC hasn't involved Conor McGregor. The world has changed. We've moved minutes. on. We did 23 minutes without mentioning Conor McGregor. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We did well. We did, we did well. But it, it's the biggest fight out there. Listen, there was all talk all this week that John Jones, Blachowicz is going to be the main event. And then there was talk about, obviously, the welterweight being the main event. But nobody out there rejoiced, would have rejoiced more because this fight's the biggest fight. Well, bigger than both those title fights. No. How crazy is that? No, it's absolutely sensational. Uh, listen, thank you very much for watching all our stuff this week from Abu Dhabi and UFC 242. If you've missed any part of it, we've had Habib on the show, we've had Dustin Poirier on the show, we've had exclusive with Danny, you sitting down with him. He's been sticking microphones in all sorts of people, hanging out um, with uh, your, ma your new mate, Islam Makachev, haven't you? You know what I mean? He's even thinking of modeling his beard on him. This is, <laughs> this is the next level <laughs> stuff. That's it. The next level of stuff here on BT Sport. If you haven't seen any of the card, by the way, it is still available on box office. You can still buy it. It's available on BT Sport box office. But hopefully, we will be catching you very, very soon. Melbourne might be a little bit of a trek. Might be. Would it from my ass. But New York won't be. We'll see you soon. Yeah.